A cosmic fireworks display is expected to hit the skies early Saturday morning as the Orinded meter shower passes through. Stargazers hope meteors will light up the sky like this one from a few months ago. The Orinid shower happens for several days every year as the Earth passes through the trail of debris behind Halley's Comet. The best hours are vis of visibility are between 11 p.m. and 4 a.m. And for more on the meteor showers expected, we're joined by the National Astronomy Correspondent for the Weather Network, Andrew Fazekas. Thanks for joining us. You're also a columnist for the National Geographic. So, Andrew, can you give us some background? Remind us what exactly a meteor shower is. Sure. Well, it's basically when Earth slams into a cloud, a giant cloud of particles, uh, sand, all of them sand grain sized, really small, and they, as, as Earth slams into it, uh, all, there's a, basically a flurry of these meteors streaking across the sky as these little sand grain sized pebbles just burn up high in the atmosphere, usually around 70 to 150 kilometers above our heads. And so that's what happens during a meteor shower. Now with the Orionids though, it's, uh, it's not the most spectacular. It only has rates of about 20, 25 meteors per hour at peak time. Uh, that'll be uh, Saturday, uh, Saturday, early Saturday morning uh, in pre-dawn hours. But its main claim to fame is its superstar pedigree, which is the Halley's Comet. That's, uh, uh, that Halley's Comet is what, what's uh, produced all this uh, cloud of debris. And that's what we're seeing on uh, early Saturday morning. So when you're wishing upon a shooting star, just think back that all of those uh, shooting stars are caused by Halley's Comet. Uh, could, it, could something like this ever be dangerous? Well, you know, when, you, when, when Earth does slam into these cloud of particles, most of them, yes, are sand grain size, and they do burn up harmlessly. But every once in a while, you get maybe, uh, you know, golf ball size to basketball size stones that actually do make it to the ground. And uh, there's no real hazard of, it's a very, very minuscule chance of getting hit, but it produces a wonderful light show. Uh, we, uh, we were, a number of us remember that there were parts of a satellite coming to, to Earth recently. Uh, people were concerned, there were fears that maybe the debris would hit them. Uh, nobody had to worry this time around. Why is this one a much bigger risk than the last debunked satellite? Right. Well, this new satellite that's uh, now uh, making all the buzz uh, because it's, it is re-entering the atmosphere probably late Saturday night, early Sunday morning Canadian time. Uh, it's called ROSAT. It's huge. It's, it's actually, uh, the problem with this one is that there are bits and pieces, chunks of the satellite that will probably not burn up in the atmosphere. The largest of this ROSAT German satellite is a uh, largest piece is a, is, a, is a chunk of mirror that weighs one and a half tons. And and uh, that will probably not be able to burn up in the atmosphere. And the question is, when it, wh where exactly on the Earth is it going to go down? We don't really know. We have to remember, two-thirds of the Earth is covered by oceans. So most likely, it'll harmlessly just fall into somewhere uh, in, in an ocean. But you never know. And uh, scientists are keeping an eye on this because of those, those potential hazards. Yesterday, the youngest planet was discovered about 2 million years old. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yes, this baby little planet, it, it now holds the record as the youngest exoplanet discovered by astronomers. It's about 2 million years old. It sits 450 light years from Earth, and it's still swaddled in, in gas and dust as it uh, circles its, uh, its young star. And it's, uh, it's amazing. We're pushing the limits on how far back in time we can see uh, planets, and this is going to help astronomers understand how planets form and evolve, just like the planets like Earth and other sister planets in our solar system. System. And what does this most recent discovery say in terms of our space exploration? I mean, how much more do we have to discover? Well, I mean, it's amazing. It's thanks to technological uh, innovations that, uh, that lar some of our largest telescopes in the world are equipped with that allows us to, to sort, of, sort of push back the limits on, on you know, finding things, the farthest galaxies in, in, in the universe, finding the youngest planets. Of course, the Holy Grail is finding an Earth-sized planet. But this is one step forward in, uh, in us learning about uh, our, the universe around us. Andrew Fasikas is the National Astronomy Correspondent for the Weather Network. Thank you so much. My pleasure.